Okay, so now that we have all this housekeeping uh, done, let's start this, um, this webinar. So I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this session on char participation in design and implementation. So I'm Sandra Mignon, I'm the co-lead of the CAFAC Task Force with Plan International, and I will facilitate the sessions with Hesfef, who is uh, the co-facilitator for, for the session. So, um, the, yes? It's very to say, it's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm really delighted to be here today, um, representing the Alliance Secretariat team, and I really look forward to also listening and learning from you all. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Hesfef. Right, so this session is aligned with the strategic priority on accountability, which is uh, the second uh, strategic priority of the Alliance. And today we have a special focus on accountability to children in involving them in program design and in implementation. And so throughout the day, throughout the, the, the session, we're going to have few panelists we're going to talk about their experience in involving children in design and implementation. So before we start, we would like to know where you are in the world. So you will find in the chat a link to uh, Mentimeter. So this is this. Um, yes, thank you. This is uh, this link where you can look at yourself on the map so that we can see where you are working. So let's take a minute to do that so that we know who is in the room, where you're attending from. All right, so we can see some people coming, mainly in Europe, as it seems. Right, so mainly European this morning. This is uh, definitely a bit early for the Americans and Latin Americans. So welcome you all to this, uh, to this session. So now um, I'm very pleased to welcome well, three panelists uh, for this session. Uh, so let's move back to the slides and have the second slide with a panelist. So today we have Flavio Sodad, who is the founder of Gigondo Pelapaz um, in DRC. We have Oliver Michael, who is a program manager at Help a Child in South Sudan. And Santino Ajit, who is program manager at CAS in South Sudan as well. So we will start with a presentation from each panelist, and then we will move to a panel discussion. So as I mentioned, feel free to ask questions throughout using the Q&A uh, button. So without further ado, let's start with Santino. Santino, over to you for your presentation. Right. Uh, uh, thanks to the panelists uh, of today's special uh, 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 sessions and involving in, uh, in implementations of activities. Uh, I, CAPS, CAPS is uh, a national NGO in South Sudan. Uh, it is, uh, it's working in the following areas in South Sudan. Once it is in a wheel, uh, it's also in law, uh, wow, joint, uh, will list, and will West counties. Our areas of focus in, in, in within cards are one of them is uh, child protection rights, one of the focus we have, uh, human rights, uh, gender based violence, health, uh, food security, uh, water and sanitation, education, uh, peace building and environmental protections. So these are just the areas that we are focusing in in South Sudan. Uh, next, next slide. This was just a brief introduction about cuts. So we'll go to next slide. Over to you. Next slide, yeah. Sandra. Sandra. OK, OK. You, as you can see over here, back slide one. The first, go back one slide, previous slide. You project the previous slide. So, like I said, probably as you can see here, uh, this is the map of South Sudan, and uh, that where we are operating in. Okay, this is what I was talking about. Here you can see this is uh, the school in South Sudan in a wheel. Uh, it's called San Daniel Kamboni School. Uh, this is one of the school closing day, and during the closing day, all right. Uh, over here, 
like I said before, it is the map of South Sudan in the, in the streets. And those are the areas that we work that I has already talked about you about it. Okay, good. This is where I am right now. Uh, we work with children, children with the whole parental care. That is what I, what, what I want to say is that uh, six children. Our purpose here is what is to protect, uh, protect children against use of drugs, substance or drugs abuse or alcoholic in the street. So we are trying to do the counseling and mentorship so that they cannot be part of this uh, drug abuse. Uh, next slide. Our main focus here is to help children not being drug addicted and to, to prevent them from, yes, this is your goal. How do we do? Uh, these are the activities that we, we do in the cards. Our activities are rehearsed along. One of the activities that we do is the radio talk show. We do the radio talk show within the communities that we work, whereby we talk about uh, these uh, substances that children are using in the streets. Uh, we talk. We, we talk about. We also do debates, debate in school and poetry on children, because uh, debates and so when we do this, we are trying to encourage children to be good citizens and to be good people in the, their respective societies. We also what do what we call the dramas in our communities, uh, in community gatherings, in the churches and all meetings. We do that, and we advocate to include child uh, preachings in our churches where we are praying in our churches. In our location, in our location, location here, we are encouraging or advocating that uh, the children's rights and participation should be encouraged uh, through our seminars in the church, uh, through our gatherings, so that uh, they feel and be part of the part of the program. Next slide. So next slide. Are you getting me? So this is the, the these are the activities. Okay. Uh, now, why we choose drama uh, with children? One, we are saying that drama entertains and has simple messages, simple messages to children. Children, they like what they see. They like what they hear as a simple message. So by doing drama, we are trying to educate them so that they get a good message uh, within a short period of time, and also they see the pictures, the pictures with the message being displayed to them. And this can reach to many children. So that's why we choose drama. So we also think that the drama uh, develops the young people to be good citizens. So when, when we talk of drama, we use different things, uh, to different plays, different uh, backgrounds uh, to talk about the goodness of the children, what they should be, and what they ought to be, and what they need to be in the future. So drama develops uh, young people to be good citizens in their respective countries. They can also be successful lifelong learners. You know, when they use this drama, uh, they can be good speakers, they can be anything in their life if they choose to, because they have learned and be able to be good citizens in their respective classes. We are also choosing drama so that we create the creativity and, product and productiveness of the individual in their community. So we are teaching children to be creative and to be productive members in their respective communities, uh, wherever they are in South Sudan, and to encourage them to be part and parcel of their community in their communities. So that's why we choose drama. Uh, drama, we think that if the people are environmentally aware of members of society, so these children, when we play drama, uh, they are become aware of the, the themselves as members of societies, where they come from, members of the, the country, where they come from. Uh, they, they, they become a low, low of abiding people. They become to know what they are, and what they need to contribute to their respective communities so that they can be good citizens, be good people within their communities and be part and parcel of the development within the country. So that is how we are, that's why we are involving children in our activities and we're using, we are using drama to talk to them using simple messages uh, so that uh, simple messages so that they can be part and parcel of this and also they become a part and community and they own it. I think uh, this is how we are dealing with it here in, in, within cuts in South Sudan. We talk so much about, we like uh, children a lot and we want them part of it in the presentation and part of our activities. The, the reason is that we want them to be, uh, to, to move away from this where they are now. As you can see, many of them, we are, but as I said, cuts work with the children and all the children, some of them are, 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 are the, their single parent or the orphan, they have no, they have no mothers, and maybe they have no parents, single, single parents, and to involve them. So they feel 
they feel hopeless. They, you know, they, so they cannot afford to go to school. They, can, they are not able to pay school fees. They are not able to do this. So they, the only option they choose is to go to sit. And our main focus here is to involve them in our community so that they can be part and parcel uh, and parcel of the community. So that's why we involve them. We do dramas in all the school within the areas of work here in South Sudan, uh, so that the, the children know how they are important, what they need to be in the communities, and how they should be uh, should be respected, and also they should work with the people to be part of this. I think uh, this is part of my presentation today. Uh, if anything that is not understood, I will be, I will be open to uh, to take questions later on. Over to you, Sandra. I think this was the last of the slide. Thank you, Santino. Thank you very much. And it seems, yes, there is a, a slight delay with South Sudan. So thank you. And, and very interesting presentation. Very interesting to hear how you're involving children through drama uh, to give those messages to the children, to the communities, how you involve churches. And we can see how this is um, an easier way to, to pass messages to, uh, to the community, but also to develop some skills for, for the children, like speaking, public speaking skills, uh, which uh, these are skills they can use later in their life. So thank you, Santino. So now um, we're going to move to Oliver. Oliver from Help a Child. Um, let's go back to the first slide. Sorry, the first slide for Oliver. Yes, that one. Oliver, over to you. Oliver, we cannot hear you. Uh, oh, I think uh, now it's coming. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Oliver Michael. I'm working with Help a Child um, as program manager in South Sudan. And um, Help a Child is an international organization founded in 1968 in the, uh, in the Netherlands. And um, Help a Child established each office in South Sudan in 2018. Currently, we are working in three um, locations in uh, Western Bargazal, Warab, and Pibor. And our, uh, basically in two thematic programs, that, that is protection, with focus on child protection, and then livelihood um, and food security. These are the three areas. So in our approach of working with children, we try as much as possible to give the opportunity to children to lead the process of advocacy and strengthening social cohesion among South Sudanese and among the communities in the areas of operation. Boruboru being one of the traditional South Sudanese sport, mainly played by girls, was identified as one of the uh, most innovative uh, traditional sports to use, to develop and to use um, for advocacy and for creating platform for, for leaders and children to interact in the communities. So, Borboru was developed in 2015, and since then, it has been adapted and uh, also recognized by the government of South Sudan as one of the uh, South Sudanese sports. It's been played in schools and in communities. So as by the, the title of this slide, children in the lead of protection and social cohesion advocacy through Borboru sport in South Sudan. We can move to the next slide. Sandra. Yes, the question is how do children, how are children empowered to lead in child rights advocacy through Borboru? As you can see from the five steps here, at the beginning, we, we ensure that children, of course, they don't know anything about Borboru in the first stage, but then we have to mobilize by creating awareness and in the communities, to parents, uh, traditional authorities, and to children themselves, to see the value of Boru in their community. And then they will start coming up to get registered. At stage two, we basically uh, help them to form teams, select themselves and form groups, 
and then we'll help them um, to understand basically the importance of working in teams and in groups. And that will help them to know the importance of each, each member of their, of their group. In SIG3, basically we train some individuals appointed by the children themselves to become their coaches and referees, to represent them as their leaders or team leaders. The interest is really not to make them you know, like a sport, but to have these coaches to continue to help them when we are not there. At stage four, we conduct training to the players and these trainings contain this content of leadership skills, decision-making, public speaking, nonviolence, teamwork, time management, advocacy, and the skill, advocacy and skills in playing Burburi itself. All these skills will be practiced practically in the field during the plays, and that is in stage one. They apply all these skills during the plays because they keep evaluating and asking them how they feel and what helped them really to win so that they can learn from it and believe that yes, leadership is good. Taking good decisions is good. Public speaking and communication is good. So at stage five, we launch, we basically launch the campaign. And of course they are always in, in lead through their leadership that we formed at stage three. At, in this stage five group stage, we basically play this and these are at community level. As they play at various levels, they keep zooming out, zooming out, going to the upper, upper level, uh, administrative levels. Um, at the Payam, at the county, and finally at the state level. And at the state level here is the largest platform attracting all the state leadership, the, the, the county leadership, and then NGOs and uh, the churches, all of them, the school administrators will, will meet here, and parents, of course, to come and enjoy the body itself, but also to contribute to the platform and listen to children sending them messages through banners, uh, brochures, and songs, and, and uh, speeches. Let's move to the next. Yes, what are the benefits of Boroboru? Why Boroboru? Boroboru is important because it in, um, increases participation of children in protection, and for sure it does. Boroboru also inspires and builds confidence and self-esteem, especially with girls in our communities here, especially in the rural areas, to develop lobby and advocacy skills among children. It also increases the understanding of the rights of children. It creates platforms for children to interact with their peers, parents, community leaders, and public officials. Borboro also creates massive awareness about the rights of children to reduce negative cultural practices. Borboro strengthens social cohesion among children and inter-community interactions to reduce and prevent conflicts. Borboro, the last point, Borboro reduces on the widening gender gap in the communities, especially in sports or generally in the roles of women and girls in the communities. That's why we said, uh, well, let's use this approach, which the communities can identify themselves with it, and they will love it definitely. It's something that they have known. Next. Yes, here you can see how the children are cheering. And um, in the first picture on upper right-hand side, they, these are two teams that played and another one, one team uh, won, and they are celebrating. And the other, group, the other team also joined in the celebration. It's not only one, because that's how they were taught, you know, to build social cohesion um, and to be tolerant in, you know, in when they are defeated or when you win, celebrate victory together. And um, below that uh, first picture, you can see the girls advocating, advocating and displaying serious messages to their leaders. And that, is, that comes directly from their hearts. They are the ones who crafted these messages without anybody giving them. So they know then the context and the environment in which they live 
and what kind of message they should send to their leaders and to other community uh, representatives as well as to NGOs. These messages are very important, and this is what we really need, how girls and children should take lead in the campaigns. On the right is um, a girl um, reading very, very strong message. Uh, it's a speech written by, by the girls themselves, the household, and read to the leaders. Um, this lady, this girl confessed that she wouldn't have been able to present herself like this because she was very shy, very scared. But after the training and se uh, several I mean, uh, rehearsals, she was able to present herself to her capacity. This is what this, this, this girl said. Yes, to the next. Yes, here you can also see um, the impact of the platform that is created by Boroboru. Um, and these girls here on the right side, on the left side, they are displaying messages about um, uh, the issues that affect them directly and how, what kind of solutions they need. Because in this community, girls are married off at, as early as, or booked for marriage as early as uh, uh, 10 years. And then, of course, they want liberation. They need liberation, and that's why they're sending these messages. On the right, these are some messages sent, written, and designed by the girls themselves and handed to county leaders. And uh, the executive director of Help a Child on Extreme Right is holding a message from a child saying, I wish to work for Help a Child in future. And that message is very important that they know their rights. And exactly why they want what they want to do, and they're trying to visualize visualize their future. That's all from me. If there are questions, follow up uh, comments. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Very inspiring, and I love how you use sports really as a way to empower girls, to empower children, as advocates and and how you can build their confidence, right? We can really feel that in your presentation. And, um, and also how you contribute to change social norms, right? And involving these girls and making them agent of change in their communities. So it's very inspiring. Thank you. So now I will ask Flavio um, to come and present. So just as a reminder for all uh, participants, Please select the interpretation channel English as Flavio will present in French. So click on the icon, the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select the English channel if you want to follow in English. Flavio, over to you. Bonjour, merci Sandra, et merci l'Alliance pour l'opportunité. Good morning, thank you Sandra. Thank you for the fantastic presentations I've just heard. I'm part of an organization that is called Jingando Pelapas that is using capoeira to fight against violence and armed groups. We started our activity in Brazil in 2005. And we started with a march for the promotion of capoeira in Brazil and for the fight against these armed groups. We are working on projects to reinsert, reintegrate the children that were involved in gangs. And we started the development of our, our methodology that integrates children and young people at every step. According to this methodology, could you switch to the next page, please? According to this methodology, we decided to use Caprera, even if it was already used in Brazil. This was developed by the most vulnerable people to promote them. And we thought about how we could integrate Caprera among children in order to protect them. And we reached to a model 
we reached a model that is based on three pillars. The first one is family. Can you click on? Yes, thank you. The second one is the community. And the third one is the capoeira. On this picture, can you go back, please? Yes, thank you. This protection model is based on the needs of children. That is to say that we are listening to children at any time because being alive is a right, but staying alive is a privilege for some of the children. So we managed to collaborate to get a safe place. This is the family, the cell of the family and the community. We are talking about churches, schools, all the different groups and places in the community, even people that are selling things in the street. This is the case in the DRC, for instance, in which informal work is very important and people that are part of the community are aware of the need to protect children so that the children can get a job, can access information and can get empowered. So we carried out an experience in DRC in which we arrived in 2014. We worked with the AMAD Association, which is our fundraiser, our, don our donor. And we worked so that these children can get information and can act. Can we get to the next slide? Thank you. So we worked on this pattern, these models of jobs, and this allows children to be integrated to the safe space and to get information that allows them to think and then act in their job. So within Jingando Pelapas, the children are very active. They are part of the community at all times. And young people, children are aware of their rights and receive tools so they can become the first agent of their own protection. So the goal is to contribute to strengthen family and community thanks to the strengthening of families. We work with parents for the children who have parents and this allow to this allows to rebuild the trust connections because when there are violent areas such as in DRC or Brazil, as soon as the violence sets up, then this link gets broken. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. So we developed a protection model and we noticed that we had to think about the development of children. So we were thinking about um, children that were demobilized from armed groups. We were thinking about young girls, about children living in the street. We worked uh, with social educators in Goma, in DRC, for instance. So we worked on this de-traumatization process to deconstruct it. And we built a model with four steps. In this de-traumatization process, we welcome the children with all their traumas. The children are all only thinking about uh, what they are suffering from. They don't know how to express their feelings. And that is when we can use capoeira. This is one of our tools to work on cognition and to invite the child to move on 
by looking around and seeing that they are part of a group. As part of the group, they start to get socialized. Sometimes it is not done by speaking, but by moving. So uh, that is why Caprewa is very interesting because it has some musical aspects and some movement aspects. So uh, their chi the children can act, can move, can be part of a circle. The Capoeira was integrated in DRC in the UNICEF program that took place in between 2014 and 2018, and it benefited to many children. We could also improve the psychological psychological support of children. And this was done to integrate children and young people in the response. So children and young people are integrated at every step in order to improve our approach when we're planning activities. And it's mostly children and young people that are part of this work. We then decided after this UNICEF program that was called Capoeira for Peace to start a training center. We saw that there were many young people that wanted to go on with the training and that wanted to take part in projects. So that is why we started the social Caprera training centers that are based on integration, training, and action. The idea is to share information, quality information with children and young people so that they can develop their thinking abilities and we are not considering capoeira as a martial art but as a sort of job that is why we named it social capoeira in the training centers we train these children to much more than the traditional practice of capoeira so uh, traditional capoeira is based on a game-based approach. And we integrate the rights of children and the rights of women. We are focusing on women so that they can empower. And after these trainings, we move to action. So we use the pedagogics of Paulo Strace which is a famous trainer in Brazil. The idea is that we can use the information to move on. So we carry out different actions with the young people on top of the training of children. The training of children that were demobilized from armed groups or uh, among girls who suffered sexual abuse this was done in partnership with other international and national organizations. And we take part in the building of dialogue and the building of peace. Next slide, please. This is done thanks to the circles we use in Capoeira. It's one of the oldest symbols. So we get back to the, the origin of the Caprera principle. This is used to rebuild bonds of trust because this is thanks to trust that young people and children can rebuild their identity after a traumatic time. And this is thanks to trust that these children and young people can take part in their community and rebuild these bonds of trust this allows the community to face all the threats and the challenges they are faced with every day. 
I wanted to thank you for the opportunity of this presentation. Thank you, Sandra. Excellent presentation. Very interesting to see how you're using the social caprera as an entry point and, and, and engage children as really agent of change, right? So it's not only them being recipient of, of support, but it's also giving them the tools so that they can protect themselves. And uh, yeah, I was very interested to know like how you use social capture also to socialize children, to give them ways to express themselves and particularly for the children associated with armed forces and armed groups, we know how difficult this is to engage them. So I can, can see how they would really like Caprera as a way to express themselves in a non-violent way. So um, very good presentation. Thank you, Flavio. We can see also the link with the other presentations on uh, how to use sports, how to use drama, how to use... Um, Capoeira to, to engage children to, to be agent of change. Thank you. So now we would like to hear from you, um, participants. And uh, so we have a couple of questions. The first one is, um, have you already engaged children in the design of programs? So you will see those questions popping up on your screen. Uh, so this is a Zoom poll, so you don't need to click on anything, but just answer those two questions, so with a yes or no. So have you already engaged children in the design of programs? And the second one is engaging children has leads of activities. So you see like there are, um, we look at two different entry points. One is the children and as you conceptualize your program, if you engage them, or if you engage them more as leads of activities. So feel free to click the yes or no um, answers. All right, okay. Do we have any results to share? Interesting. So yes, all right. So for the first question, some of you have engaged children in the design of programs. So congratulations, we know this is not easy. And we can see that this is uh, a bit easier to engage them as leads of activities. Right, and, and, and indeed, like we've seen today, like all the, the advantages of involving them as leads of activities. All right, so thank you, very interesting results. So now this um, leads us to our panel discussion. So we have a few questions for our panelists. And again, feel free to use the Q&A function, the little button at the bottom of your screen if you want to ask any questions to our panelists. We'll have a time after the panel discussion for you to ask questions. So the first question that I have for you um, is uh, if you can tell us more about how um, children are involved in the design and in the implementation of, um, of your programs. So first, I'd like to ask this question to Oliver. Oliver, would you like to tell us how, with Help a Child, you engage children in the design and in the implementation? Thank you very much for the question, uh, Sandra. Um, for help a child, what we do is, um, as I presented, we engage children basically by introducing um, uh, our approach in a community and say, we're having this initiative. Can you identify yourself with this? They'll say, yes, yes, we know Goroboru. Traditionally, we know Goroboru, but we didn't know that Goroboru could be developed to this level. So now, would like to register to, to get engaged in this process. So, and then they obviously will start coming to our child-friendly space center to register, and then we we'll start training them on you know the uh, the rules and guidelines of how to play, and then select their own leaders, their own coaches, their referees, and we train them, and then they start leading the process from there, basically playing the sport while also crafting their messages and displaying messages, communication to the community and among themselves our children, discussing issues that affect them directly. So psychosocial traumatic uh, experiences, then you know, that builds them, that helps to strengthen their confidence 
and self-esteem in the process as they zoom out with their campaigns. In most cases, uh, from the center, they go out as they engage teams from other communities, teams from other uh, child-friendly space, really making it, you know, creating different levels of platforms where they can interact with their parents and uh, with the communities as well. So this is how basically our role as help a child is to, to strengthen their capacity, their competencies, and then guide them through, and then they are in the front line. Thank you, Oliver. Very interesting. Um, yeah, how the, those children can engage other children who are also adults, and that's uh, that's great. I really like that. <laughs> Um, right, so um, now Flavio, what is your experience in, in DRC on, on how to engage children in the design and implementation? Merci Sandra. Thank you very much Sandra for this opportunity. With Jingando Pelapas, the CAPRA represents the community. We are always in circles and we integrate the children from the very start. As I was saying, in Haiti, we were even involving the children in the design of our development model. And from that moment on, we started investing in children and young people because we noticed that the leaders we need um, have to be trained from very early on. So we started working with these children that were at ease being in front of the others to contribute to the thinking and the identification of needs and indicators. In our model, especially in DRC, we have seven assistants that are boys and girls that present the activities designed by the children to our partners. And there are different steps to plan these activities. So it's planning on Monday assessment every Friday. And there's a constant talk with them to identify the needs of the children, the potential changes in terms of strategy, and also the identification of indicators. So we're not only talking about the issues that were solved, but about the indicators, because children have extraordinary capacities to find responses to all the problems. In DRC, we have many problems, violence, but also natural disasters. And we know that the children are very good at designing and, and finding answers. Our model is a sort of circle in which everyone is taking part. We have the assistant group that is supported by the pedagogical coordination. And this allows the children to strengthen, strengthen their action in the community. And we work with partner organizations such as AFSI and Real Africa in DRC. So the children are integrated at all times in the design of the activities that are based on our model that was already developed with uh, children and young people in Haiti. Thank you, Fabio. Yes, very interesting to see how you're engaging um, those children in both the design and in the implementation of your programs and, and, and uh, engaging those children as assistants, right, as you call them. So, and, and I think you're right, like those children know what they need. They know their problems. They are in the community, they see what's happening. So giving them, like empowering them to take action, to lead other children, that's very powerful. Excellent, thanks. Okay, so now I have another question, which is more on the impact. So I'd like to ask this question to Santino. Santino, what? What impact did you see after engaging those children as leads of activities? Uh, thank you, Sandra. The impact that we have seen as we engage these children in activities. Uh, first, uh, children, uh, there's formation of sense of leadership among the children themselves. They feel as leaders, as the future leaders of the nations. 
Uh, also, the other impact that we have seen is that children begin to develop the positive feeling of self-worth in the society. So they see who they are in society and they decide. And then also they gain sense of purpose and feeling of direct control over the environment they are in. So I think yeah, this, is the, this is the thing we have seen in the, while we engage the children. We also see that when we engage them with uh, these activities, public, in the other hand, is also is also educated about the, the, about the children's education rights. So when, especially when we come to the drama activities in, the, in, in, in our areas of operations. Uh, so in, in that sense, children also, uh, uh, they feel that they are part of human being, and therefore, they feel proud to be involved in activities and to be lead. So these are the few, the few impacts that we have seen uh, over the years that we work with children and as we involve them uh, to lead the activities to, uh, within the, our areas of operation in South Sudan. So I think they, they feel proud of themselves and who they are and why they should be part of this. Over to you, Sandra. <laughs> Thank you, Santino. And, and yes, uh, indeed, uh, interesting to hear like how you give them this sense of self-worth, sense of purpose, and, and they know their rights. So these are like all the skills you're giving them for drama, like this uh, uh, public speaking skills, like these are skills they will, they will keep for uh, during the rest of their life. So uh, they can be proud of themselves. <laughs> Okay, Oliver, have you seen any impact also in, in your programs in South Sudan? Yes, um, thank you, Sandra. Yes, indeed. Um, we start seeing changes in uh, our, you know, the, in the children right from the uh, community-based identification process. You know, in our culture, girls are not supposed to really speak in the public come out and uh, uh, and show show you know their skills and talents in the public but then you know when we we start bringing them into the registration room you will see them really really shy and really um, stepping aside and sitting at the end at the edge of the um, room but then we just say it's fine let's all be uh, the same but when we get them out we begin playing like really facing another team from another community, you will not believe that these are the same girls who were very silent and quiet in the room because they automatically get out, you know, they get um, stimulated in the process and uh, you see them cheering, cheering their teams and trying to really get really happy and you hear their voices. So this is the first uh, transformation that we see. Um, from there, then it, as they, Continue to climb the ladder, moving upward, they become more stronger, stronger, stronger in speaking, in advocacy, and even in voicing their own issues that affect them directly. These are the really significant impact that we observe and we document as part of our uh, experience, and we get feedback from them directly throughout the process. Thank you, Oliver. Yes, it seems like a very empowering tool, right? Um, the using sports in, in South Sudan and so that girls can actually take the space and 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 feel free to speak and and be a uh, um and face other children adults and, and boys very interesting Flavio how about you in DRC have you seen any impact for, on children specifically like how the they have changed how they have evolved from the, the beginning until the end? Oui, oui. Bon, nous travaillons avec différents publics. Yes, we work with different types of children, people that were demobilized from armed groups, children living in the street, and children that suffered sexual assaults. We can see that these children come from very different environments, backgrounds, and groups. Sometimes they were almost living in the jungle and the capoeira allows them to get back to their childhood because they were trained to become soldiers and this training destroyed their skills of empathy towards others. So thanks to capoeira and other trainings we offer, culture, sports, the child can become a child again and 
be with each other and be empathetic to others. This is specific for girls and women that survived sexual abuse. After the polls, we noticed that some girls wanted to commit suicide after they were raped, unfortunately. And thanks to Capoeira, uh, these girl ch girls changed. They could not even look at one another in the eyes. They were empty. And thanks to Capoeira, they were in a safe space and they could express themselves physically or verbally. And we could notice that girls were started to be aware of themselves. And then they started to get back their identity as a person, as a human being, as a girl, as a young woman. And from that point on, they want to give back what they received. And this is when we see that many girls that lived very traumatic events are now training other girls and women. They have a very strong power in their speech in the community and also within the training space. So I think this is a great, extraordinary impact actually that we can present and that was done thanks to our partner organization. Thank you very much, Sandra. It's fascinating how with Camprera, you can help children to reveal their identity and, and their even sense of, you know, their, of their own body and, and, um, and empathy. These are very fascinating. Thank you. Wow, what all the things we can do with, you know, in engaging children, that's uh, amazing. So, now we have uh, we have a question for you, panel, um, the participants. Well, um, we know that engaging children in activities is not always easy, and and there are a number of challenges. So you will find in the chat the link to uh, Mentimeter, so that you can share your experience in terms of the challenges that you have faced. And um, so feel free to to share your experience using Menti, the Menti link. I think you have, you have the link in the chat. You can also see on the screen. So we'd like to hear from you before we, we ask our panelists. So any challenges? Availability. Yes, children are busy. The parents interfering, that's, yes, that's, uh, I believe, yes, um, that can be an issue. And, and I think uh, it's um, uh, one of the panelists to explain how it's important to engage parents. Actually, most of you mentioned the engagement of the community and the parents so that they understand what we're doing with their children, right? And they feel reassured we're not trying to do anything wrong with them. So engaging parents from the beginning, asking their consent is, is important so they are reassured of... Um, of uh, the benefits also that their children can take from these activities. Any other challenge? The lack of self-esteem, right? We see that often at the beginning when we start engaging those children, they're not very confident. And uh, I think Flavio was saying that girls are hiding. Um, and, uh, and Oliver also mentioned this, like how girls didn't want to take the space. They're very shy. And so it's a process. It's not something that happens overnight. So it's um, managing to engage them at the beginning and gradually see how, how they progress and having the resources to implement ideas. Yes, that's true. <laughs> So thank you for all of these challenges. Um, now we're gonna ask our participants. 
feel free to keep adding. Oh, so yes, there's some more staff and adults are two directives sometimes. There is a need for specific competencies to support. Hmm. Yes, that's interesting. It's also changing the way we interact with children and to give them the space to actually um, take the lead. And, and often as adults, it's not always uh, uh, easy, right? We are, we're used to control children and, and tell them what to do. And that's a lot easier than actually letting go and let it children take the lead. Yes, that's the process. And I guess it's also the, the spirit of the, uh, of the organization on how you, you transmit that to your, to your staff. And it's like your role is, is not to, to direct or, or to lead, but it's more to create the space so that children can feel empowered to then take the lead, right? So that's a mind shift, I think, for a number of people. Right, so now... Let's hear from our panelists on this question, like in terms of the challenges that, that they have uh, faced. Sentino, would you like to go first on this question and share some of the main challenges you have faced in, in South Sudan in implementing these programs with children? Okay. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Uh, as I said before, uh, we work with different with many children. Some of the children are in schools, and some are on the streets. So one of the challenges that we have faced over the years is that uh, when you are working with these street children, uh, you found that some of these children they are drug addicted. So trying to move from that addiction is a problem. So this we have found that it is one of the challenges that we have in uh, working with children who are on the street because of drug they are using. Uh, we have one, we also have uh, I think uh, one of the challenges also is the lack of uh, proper parental care or attention to these children. So it is a problem uh, uh, that we are also encountering and the challenges that we are having. We have the influence from the peer group uh, among the children. So they are, they are being uh, involved in the peer group. So they become tend not to listen, tend not to participate. And there's also lack of social responsibility. You know, children, they don't want to be, sometimes they don't uh, have to be, uh, want to be part of this thing because they are not responsible themselves. Then uh, here in South Sudan, like I well, where we have a lot of problems, there's also lack of uh, access to education is a problem that we have. Sometimes we want to, to take them to school. Some they are not able to, school to go, they are not able to, because of due to funds, Funding is an issue to them, so we are, we are not able to get the right people or to get the, to take them to school. So lack of funding is another thing that we are having here. Here also in South Sudan, the country come from the world. There's also rampant child abuse. What I mean is that there's child defilement, you know, or child raping. You know, like last week here in the world or last month, a child of a little, a little girl of five years old was defiled and, and raped and killed to death by an, a child that was in the town. Arab children. So these are challenges that we are having. And so I think there are countable challenges that we are having in uh, dealing with these children because I think I have problems with Are you getting in? Okay. Uh, so like I said, uh, children uh, or the parents on the Caleb, they need to be educated so that they don't they, they don't abuse their children in the, in the country. So I think uh, over the years, these are just few of the challenges that we have faced uh, over to your children. My mic is problem. Thank you, Santino, for all of these challenges, right? Drug addiction, lack of parental care, the influence of peers that can uh, sometimes uh, may not encourage them to, to be part of your activities and, and, and violence, it seems, in general. Can you just tell us more about how you overcame those challenges? Okay, uh, how we are managing these children is we are, we are doing what is called like stakeholders uh, meetings regularly within our area of operation. So wherever we go, both children and parents to be part of the meeting where we sensitize the community to create awareness why, uh, so that we bring these children together closer to us and closer to the people. So I think uh, this is one of the things we are doing in, uh, in, in school. 
Also, when we go to school, we are doing what is called PTA, parent teachers training sessions, whereby we call both school children and, and parents in the school and teachers, we train them uh, so that uh, they know uh, what uh, they know their, their respective role within the communities. Uh, we are also doing uh, radio, radio talk shows within our, within our local areas, uh, talking about the usefulness of children and why they should be involved in all the activities. Uh, in using uh, our local languages and so that the language that they can understand. So I think uh, carrying out radio talk show frequently is, uh, is one is, is how we are able to manage these things. One of the things also we are doing disseminations of uh, laws, which is kind of like especially the Shell Act. Uh, we, are we are doing dissemination of it so that we prevent this uh, Shell abuse, the rampant Shell abuse within the town, so that uh, everybody understands that every Shell has the right to life, has the right to protection and the right to education. So dissemination of local laws is part of the things that we are doing, sensitize the communities uh, so that they can be able to impress and support the children in all their activities. I think that is the, these are the few examples that we have used in the past and some of them has worked. Uh, so uh, I think uh, when we were doing the stakeholders meeting, you know, like the crowd with the children, uh, a good example was that, you know, there's a certain boy and a girl, they were drug addicted. So when we begin to do the drama, we take, take them and perform dramas and talk to them about the, what they should be, their suspected community. These children tend to be good, to, to be good children. Uh, they went back to their suspected communities, they went back to school, and now they are very uh, inspiring in their suspected school, and they are performing well. And in the past, there were children that were in the state, but through our interventions of holding frequent meetings, sensitization of guns and children awareness within, within the communities and what they ought to be in the future. They were able to turn out to be the good people. I think uh, frequent stakeholders meeting is one of the key, key things that we are using here to talk to these children, uh, to value them and to involve them, to say that you can do it. I think it's difficult. So I think uh, this is uh, what we have done in the past and it had works. Thank you. Over to you, Kamala. Thank you for these examples of how you engage the various um, stakeholders and uh, the parents and teacher association. We know these are very powerful uh, groups that then can be engaged in uh, all this awareness raising that you're doing, right? So that's uh, interesting. And I, and I like the example you gave of those uh, two children who were drug addict and, and food, um, playing drums and, and gradually engaging them, finding people who are there to support and to believe in them. I think this is what I heard, right? Like people who believe exactly, yeah. in those children and then give them a different perspective on themselves. Like you're not just, you know, using drugs, you can do other things. And, and here is another way that you can, uh, you can take, right? Um, very interesting. Thank you, Santino. Um, now I'd like to turn to Oliver. Oliver, any challenges that you have faced and how you, uh, you overcame them? Yes, uh, thank you, Sandra. Um, first of all, for sure, we have uh, been experiencing a lot of challenges in, in uh, implementing Borboro. Um, as a, a new newly developed sport uh, in the country and it's only focusing on girls. It becomes even more sensitive for parents to see people mobilizing their girls to go and play, you know, where they are boys or they are men or whatever, they don't understand that. From the beginning, we faced significant resistance from parents, but then gradually we started uh, Developing, uh, we developed actually a consent form uh, where a parent, especially when we're working in, in host communities or in IDP camps, we encourage parents to sign a consent let letter together with their daughter or their children so that they can participate in, a, and that has been working really well. In the form, we also screen the background, health background of their children before who can engage them in the sport itself because some children may be having breathing problem or chronic issues. So it's only the parents who can tell us that, yes, 
then we will find where that child can fit. Uh, maybe he or she will not play, uh, and then uh, she may still play roles in first aid, you know, like, like you know, adjusting or whatever. There are other roles in the structure where we can fit the child with uh, some problems. Secondly, uh, when we are working in a school, in institution, like uh, working with children in schools, we basically engage the school administrators, um, you know, to build confidence and tell them, yeah, this is what we're doing. And we started producing pictures of, of children, uh, especially children who perform the best, like the best players of the year or best players of the, of the, of the campaign. Then we take picture and invite their parents, especially to come and witness uh, the performance of their children. And that encourages parents to really uh, also encourage their children to go and join uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the game, in the matches. In other communities where um, girls are booked for marriage at um, an age of five, five years old, girls already booked. Actually, you know, um, when you engage girls from 10 and above in these matches, you see the people who come to watch them play are basically their future husbands. So um, they also get a little bit resistant sometimes uh, because even if they are, the children are still staying with their parents, they, 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 the husbands who have booked them still claim a lot of rights over them. So, but then we also invite them to come and see how we, we train, how we empower the girls to really stand for, to understand their rights and to play important roles in the community. And then they come, they, participate, they also attend and witness. Um, sometimes you see them even raising up their hands to comment and to, uh, to appreciate the work of help a child. Um, yeah, this, these are some of the challenges, but sometimes you also, um, because of traditions and taboos, um, you know, the way that girls dress, uh, the, the sportive way, you know, putting on the jerseys and some, in some cultures, they don't like it. Um, but then uh, we have to pass through the administrators, the, like the, um, the authorities, the local government authorities, um, to basically explain and also support because we have uh, the sports departments in all uh, the local government uh, locations. And uh, through them, it's always easier to convince the parents and uh, to reduce some of the resistance that we face. Otherwise, generally, uh, Borboro is already catching, um, you know, fire and being accepted in all communities. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. It sounds, uh, yes, that indeed, like there is a, a lot of enthusiasm uh, around Boro Boro. And, um, and, and yes, I can, I can imagine that in a context like South Sudan, it's not always easy to, to do this uh, empowerment of girls and particularly for those who are already promised for, for marriage. So, uh, I can only imagine the resistance you, you, you're facing from the, the community and from the future husbands as well. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we came to the end of our panel discussion. Uh, so now we have some time for questions and answers from all participants. So Feel free to use the, the Q&A function, like the little button with the two bubbles at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask any question to our panelists. Anything uh, you would like to know more, maybe waiting for, for you to share some, uh, some questions. I have one more question. Um, I can only imagine that in the context where you work, like DRC, South Sudan, uh, there are a number of risks and then we heard like the challenges. So are there any like um, measures that you have taken before the start of your program to mitigate those risks? Like things that you did consciously before and saying, we know that this can, you know, um, that may create some risk for children. So we're gonna put all those safeguards in place so that we mitigate this risk. Uh, Flavio, would you like to, to give your perspective from, uh, 
from DRC. Merci, Sandra. Thank you very much, Sandra. The risk we have shared before are some risks, but the main risk we have here is the risks related to military violence in the neighborhood where the children are living. The major risks are rapes, mobilization by armed groups, integration of children in criminal gangs. So what we do is we meet the children, we meet the parents of the children. So the children are inviting their parents to come to our meetings. We have bi-monthly meetings. And the idea is to create a network of parents with the children and young people in order to answer to these threats. This allows us to have a quick answer, quick response to the threats that the children and young people are faced with on a daily basis. As soon as the children are in the street, some children walk 1.5 kilometer to get to the Capria, Capuera space for the training. And they have 1.5 kilometer to get back. Sometimes there are young girls who have babies already. So we are working to raise awareness among the community so that they understand what Capuera is, what are the benefits of it. And the Capuera is considered as something for peace by the community. The social capoeira, the trainings for peace, allow us to transfer this safety towards the community. This is done mainly through interviews with girls. We have some social visits every month. And the community can see those girls as Caprera practitioners. And those who do Caprera are considered as defenders of peace. So even children that are not doing Caprera yet, uh, they say, oh, this girl is a Caprera practitioner, so we shouldn't touch her. We can see that there is an ideology. There are different ideologies ours that there's also that of the armed groups but we are using our capra ideology for peace peace building and if i'm a caprera practitioner then i'm defending peace i'm an agent of peace and this allows me to protect children in haiti one of the children was almost killed by a gang but then there was a gang member that saw this girl and that said, no, uh, this girl does Caprera, so we shouldn't uh, touch her. She should go back home. But obviously, this is not something that works all the time because another child was killed, unfortunately. Anyway, there is the concept of Caprera as something that is contributing efficiently to peace building. I mean, I'm just very impressed. I think that's uh, such a great way of setting up, you know, the environment for for your activities. And indeed, like uh, gangs who don't want to approach people who are part of the Caprera. I mean, that's uh, significant achievements. I think he can be uh, really proud. Right. So let's see. I think now we have... Um, one question in the chat, um, in the Q&A. Um, so are these initiatives happening in other regions? And see if there is any plan to expand in other countries. And, um, and can you support those who would like to set up similar initiatives? Yeah, so these are some questions. So uh, who would be interested to to contribute to to respond to this question yeah yes oliver yeah go ahead. yes yes um for sure we are currently 
you know, we are working in South Sudan, but um, Help a Child also works in other countries, in Malawi, in DRC Congo, in Burundi and Rwanda, and in Kenya, in Africa. Um, our colleagues in Congo have uh, surely asked us to introduce, to come and train uh, some of their staff um, so that they can integrate uh, Borboru approach in their programming. And I know um, like here in South Sudan, more than six other international organizations have already started using Borboru uh, for campaign and for uh, empowerment, as well as many other national organizations. And so, yes, we are ready. We have the, uh, the, the manual, we have the training materials and uh, everything ready for uh, empowering um, and for expansion. Yeah, to our any location where they really, our partners and potential partners who are willing to take up this, this uh, cause, we are ready to help. Excellent, thank you, Oliver. <laughs> Anyone else would like to contribute? Yes, Flavio. Bon, en parlant des centres de formation la capoeira sociale, on a trois objectifs. Talking about the training centers for social capoeira, we have three aims. The first one is to support the organizations that are already using capoeira, so, social capoeira. So our goal is to transfer this innovative approach to other organizations, such as the program we did with UNICEF. We worked with AFC, with En Avant Les Enfants, and we might also work with PANGS Foundation in order to integrate Caprera into their actions uh, for girls that survive sexual abuse. We also have a partnership with Kajev, which is a orientation center for demobilized children. We work with partners because even if we have been active for years, and even if we have evidence of our positive impact using Capoeira, we want to strengthen partnerships in order to carry out studies and to make sure that this social technology can be transferred to other partners. And this includes other organizations in other groups in Africa. We would like to create a network for Caprera, social Caprera in Africa, but also in Latin America. We carried out some presentations in Brazil, in France, and in Haiti. So the Social Caprera Center wants to work with other organizations so that they can benefit from this approach in their program. Thank you very much. Any, anyone else would like to contribute? Or any other questions? All right, I think we are coming now to the end um, of this webinar. Thank you to, to our panelists for all of their contribution, for sharing the amazing work that you're all doing. It was very inspiring, at least for me, and I believe it was for you too as participants. So um, before we close, uh, I'd just like to ask you, um, the participants, if you would like to share with us one key takeaway that something that you found inspiring and trusting, something new that you've learned today, if you would like to, to write it in the chat, but wait, don't press send yet, just write in the chat and then uh, I will give you a minute to think about something and then we will all press send at the same time. So, Anyone uh, and uh, the panelists, uh, feel free also to share something that you've learned today, maybe from your uh, colleagues, uh, from the other panelists. Everyone, even the producers, if there is something that you found inspiring from the session, you can all write something. Let's see what I found interesting. Okay. 
Yes, so you can send it to, you select everyone in the chat, right? Uh, so that everyone can see your response and then I will tell you when to press send. All right, you're ready? Yes, you'll have written something. Okay, so three, two, one, go. Let's all send. This is called like a chat fall. <laughs> Great, yeah, and lots of uh, very interesting key takeaways. So thank you, everyone. Um, I will hand over to David for a few announcement about the, um, I think there is a survey. David, thank you. Thank you to all the producer and co-facilitators. Thank you very much indeed, Sandra. And what an inspiring session that was. Um, I'm absolutely blown away. Thank you. Um, thank you all to all our attendees. I've put a link into the chat for a uh, feedback survey on SurveyMonkey. So please do go to that and uh, tell us what how you found the session. And also, I would like to remind you that there is uh, plenty to see and do in uh, Philo. Uh, you can find their infographic discussion sessions happening. And also, if you go to the welcome page, you will find a link to the uh, Wheelo virtual coffee room where you'll have an opportunity to meet and chat with other attendees and some of our speakers as well. So please do uh, visit those spaces. And once again, thank you to everybody here for such an inspiring session. And we wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>